Uh, you know, I just wanted to play a few uh, bars. Uh, I'm going to turn this on. Last year we, last year we had this. This is from Fifth Avenue Synagogue in New York. And uh, you say, why are we looking at Fifth Avenue Synagogue when we're Christians? But we're all children of God, so are they. And this is uh, last year in this season, uh, I had a divine encounter when the Lord really uh, impressed upon me that it was important to return these feasts to the body of Christ and to the one new man. And uh, me and about probably 7,000 others are probably going about doing the same thing. Brother Paul is one of the one after the same heart as I have. And uh, we come at the feast of the Lord in a little bit different perspective than our Jewish counterparts, those that don't know Yeshua as Messiah, we come uh, in the celebratory uh, way. We come to celebrate what Jesus did for us. Not uh, looking for the Messiah, but celebrating what Messiah did. And the Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. And it's a very special day for those of us that believe in Yeshua because our sins were forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Um, the Passover lamb, and uh, so it's it's a, it's an important time of year. Uh, the thing that's important, uh, we're talking about, and we're not going to be here much more than a, maybe an hour, not even. Uh, but uh, the thing that is, uh, I would like to emphasize is that in Leviticus, when God gave the commandment to His people, to the Jewish people, to celebrate the feasts. He didn't say celebrate them until Messiah comes. He said celebrate them in an everlasting covenant. And to celebrate them uh, for forever. And so I don't know where the Christian church got the idea that we were supposed to do away with the celebration and the observances of the feasts because Messiah came. Because that's not what God said. He said these are the feasts of the Lord. And they should be a holy convocation unto you forever. Well, it's the same word we like forever, to live forever. And uh, it's the same word uh, as the feast. So uh, this is uh, this is Fifth Avenue Synagogue. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, we can't really sing the song with them, but we can hum it along. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful, it's called the Song of the Angels. And so let's go ahead and enjoy it.
ברוך אתה אדוני המבדיל בין קודש לכל שמא ישראל אדוני אלוהינו אדוני אחד אדוני Christian church who has been misled 
for 2,000 years why this is important. I continually hear people say, oh, that Jewish stuff. But it's not that Jewish stuff. It's what God prescribed and was stolen from his people. And we were duped. We were duped by the pagans who replaced the true worship of God with pagan festivals and put Jesus' name on it. I mean, Jesus was not born in December. He was not born on December 25th. His birth has nothing to do with a Christmas tree. That's a pagan thing to, to worship a pagan god. And I'm not condemning people for that. Because I know that people will use those symbols to try to bring others to Christ. I've done the same thing. But once we come to know the truth, we have a responsibility to try to walk in the truth and to share the truth with people. And uh, it's a very difficult thing. Um, even my own family doesn't fully understand it as evidenced by the fact that they decided to leave after dinner. But um, it's really it's really an important uh, thing for us because God said that they were going to be observed forever. So don't you think that if we're going to be observing him with Christ forever, that it might be interesting for us to learn a little bit about what they're about right now. Amen? And so that's my heart, and that's what I'm attempting to do. I would like to share with you from Leviticus. I want to pull it up. I was going to use it a mush, but it's a little bit tiny. read a little bit about from the commentary here. So if you're going to turn to Levit Leviticus chapter uh, 16 1, this is where I'll be reading uh, a little bit from. Uh, the sixth section of the book of Leviticus opens as God addresses Moses after a karai in Hebrew, the death of his brother Aaron's two oldest sons. God gives Moses the laws regarding the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, followed by a list of various types of behavior that are forbidden to the Jewish people. Amen? Come on, and you welcome Matthew. Yeah. So reading from Leviticus 16, God spoke to Moses on Nisan immediately after the tragic death of Aaron's two sons that occurred that day. God knew that Aaron shared his son's passionate yearning to cling to him, and therefore, in order to prevent him from suffering a similar death, he told Moses to promptly warn him not to repeat their mistake. Furthermore, he instructed Moses to emphasize that it was on account of having him properly drawn near to God that they died. For he knew that by threatening Aaron with death, he could be disabled from emulating his son's example. Specifically, he instructed him to forbid Aaron to enter the Holy of Holies on any other day than the 10th of Tishri, which was designated as the annual day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and only as part of the rites specified for that day as follows. God said to Moses, Speak to your brother Aaron and tell him that despite his desire to cling to God to the greatest extent possible, he must not come whenever he simply wishes into the part of the sanctuary beyond the partition curtain 
i.e. into the Holy of Holies, thus standing in front of the cover that rests upon the ark, in order that he not die, as his sons did. For I appear there, I appear there constantly in the form of a cloud, hovering over the ark of the cover, and entering the unhidden, the unhidden the gates upon the divine presence is an act of insolence punishable by death. Rather, I may be seen by him over the Ark of the Covenant only when he enters to produce a cloud of smoke by burning as prescribed incense on Yom Kippur as well as described presently. Furthermore, even on Yom Kippur, it is only by means of the following pr procedure that Aaron and all subsequent high priests must enter the Holy of Holies by bringing a young bull as a sin offering and as a ram as an ascent offering, both of which must purchase from his own money and offer according to the procedure that will be presented, presently described. So the, this passage of scripture will go on and will, will tell the Jewish people all the tenets of how the priest was to come into the Holy of Holies and to make a sacrifice unto the Lord on this holy day. It was a day that the sins of the people were forgiven, the whole congregation. And it was the only time that they could actually be uh, receive a blessing from God. Now we know that Messiah Jesus has come now and that we can come boldly into the throne room of grace and we can enter by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? The Lamb of God. But we still observe this day yes. in remembrance to God's commandments as a day. It's a day that the uh, children of God typically would begin a fast at sundown and uh, according to what the, uh, the Holy Spirit tells you. And they will fast for 25 hours. And uh, that's why we were having a pre-fast dinner. You know, so, and we're a little off on the timing because we're still eating and that's... Okay. That's fine. We're not we're not going at this in a legalistic way, but we're trying to learn about the symbolism behind the uh, different traditions that were involved, and also learn uh, what God was saying to His people and when. And then, how do we apply the blood of Jesus Christ and the, sac the supreme sacrifice that He made uh, to this entire uh, situation? Amen. So at this point, I'm just going to have um, Brother Paul come and share a little bit about Yom Kippur. And you notice he's traditionally wearing all white, which is a, a beautiful tradition in synagogue, to come to Yom Kippur services dressed in all white. It's kind of like uh, First Sunday is for a lot of the, the churches in the area when they come for communion. They come to celebrate being washed by the blood of the Lamb and wearing all white because we, our sins have been washed. Though they were as scarlet, we're now white. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Father 
and ask forgiveness of those around us for the transgressions that we have inflicted upon them. And it's, it's a time of sacrifice in the temple. And it's, uh, there's a procedure regarding the, uh, the blood of the sacrifice, which is for the cleaning of the temple and to render all unclean. Clean from our uncleanness. But there is a very significant element of Yom Kippur that has to do with the two goats. And it ties into the Messiah. The, the two goats are brought forth. One is to be sacrificed for the sins of the people. The other one is to be dedicated to Azazel. Yeah. And there's a red thread to be tied on the horns of the goat that's to be led into the wilderness and released for Azazel. And as the legend, it's chronicled, uh, is, is that when the priest returned after turning Azazel loose, the goat to Azazel loose, when they came, I'm skipping a step. They tie a red ribbon around, a red thread around the horns of the goat. They also tie a red thread around the, the, the handle of the door of the temple. And the Azazel goat is turned loose. And the sins of the people are to be cast upon this goat. Hence, you have the concept of a scapegoat, right? Mm -hmm. So this goat about to de dedicated to Azazel is turned loose in the wilderness. The priest returns. And when he returns, they know that God has accepted the goat to Azazel. He has accepted the goat, and the sins are forgiven when the red thread on the door turns white. Now, how many of you remember when, I mean, Solomon's temple today is, the only thing that's left is the wailing wall. Now, what happened to the rest of the temple? And it was destroyed. And prophecy says not one stone will be left upon another. Here we get into trivia, trivia that I find fascinating. Why, when, the, now when was it destroyed? It was destroyed approximately 30 years after the crucifixion of Yeshua. Now, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah ben David of the line of David. And a Messiah ben David would be a militaristic Messiah. Now, they were looking for a Messiah ben David that would perform the same functions, perform the same miracles before the people as had the, Ma the Maccabees during the Maccabean revolt. And the numbers, the numbers kind of escape me, but something to the effect of uh, 25, a band of 2,500 people led by the Maccabees who were the guardians of the wealth of the temple. They took upon themselves 50,000 men to train Greco-Assyrian forces who were trying to do them in. And they just, they took them on and they won with almost no loss whatsoever. I mean, it was a miraculous victory. So the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah ben David who would lead them in the same way. 30 years after the crucifixion of the Messiah, they led a revolt following a false Messiah. The Romans won and they tore down the temple. When they tore the temple down, they tore all the stones apart and cast them down, packed them off. But the significant, you know, but they had a real significant motivation other than just to destroy the temple. Now, their motivations were twofold. One was they wanted to do everything they could to destroy the heart of the Jewish people so they would not revolt again. But also, they plundered the gold from the temple and... The stones of the temple did not have mortar in them. They had sheets of gold in between the stones. And the stones laying upon the sheets of gold 
left them bonded together. So they tore the temple down to mine the gold. Uh -huh. Now, I'm, I'm getting to this, beating around a rabbit trail, so to speak, because there was a 30-year span from the time of the crucifixion to the time of the revolt. And during that 30 years, they continued to perform the sacrifices. They continued to tie the ribbon onto the Azazel goat. They continued to try the thread upon the door of the temple. But when Yeshua died, there was, the curtain was rent. Now, I mean, this is very significant. The, uh, there's th there were three chambers. There's a chamber for the populace. There is a chamber for the chamber of the heavens. And then beyond that is the Holy of Holies. And when they rebuilt the temple in Herod's temple, they didn't, after the Maccabeans retook the temple and they rebuilt the temple, they didn't know just quite how the, the shrouds were to lay. So they had, actually, between the Holy and Holies and the heavens, they had two curtains instead of just one. And the priest would, would walk along one curtain, go in, walk between the curtains to go into the Holy of Holies. Now, but the temple between the outer area and the heavens was this phenomenally thick, huge curtain. It is reported to be as thick as possibly a foot thick of woven cloth. What? Now, fabric is stronger than cable when it's woven in that fashion. But this unbelievably stout curtain was rent and left open for the populace to get into the heavens. Now, the Azazel go. After the, after the crucifixion of the Messiah, it is reported that the ribbon on the door never again turned white. And when they got back, the door was open. And never again would the door stay closed on Yom Kippur. The door was open and the thread was red. Now, we are to afflict ourselves. What is a fast? Um, the scriptures do not say specifically to fast. It says to afflict yourselves. It has been interpreted to be a fast. And years ago I questioned why it was we were to fast and why we were not supposed to do certain things that people within the Christian group would consider to be a sin, although it wasn't specified in scriptures that it's a sin. And I came to the understanding that God has another plan for us. We are to be, we are to be equal in inheritance to Yeshua. We are to become sons of God, not like sons of God. We are to become sons of God, equal in inheritance to Yeshua. And we are to judge over the angels. So what this says to me, in a nutshell, is this is all about self-control. We are to exercise self-control. We are to fast routinely to exercise self-control. If we can deny ourselves the basic sustenance of living, food, and deny it for a day, two days, three days, without complaint, and just move along, then we can deny ourselves all the sins of the world. And it'll be easy. So, scriptures say we are to afflict ourselves. And it is interpreted to be a fast. So, during this time, we are supposed to be seeking forgiveness from our fellow man and from God for those transgressions that we have done openly or inadvertently. We step on people's toes. We kick them in the shins. We don't even know we've done it many times. Somebody comes back a month later, two months later, and says, you know why I was upset with you? Ooh. Sometimes I feel like a real dummy, you know, I and mean, I do some... I really do some real dumb stuff, you know. And we become involved in our own worlds and our insensitivities and we offend people and we are supposed to seek atonement. 
And among other things, Kaddish is typically said over at Yom Kippur. Uh, I'm not prepared to say Kaddish for you. Um, but it is, uh, Kaddish is what we say over the dead and wishing them away yes. into saying goodbye for them. Mm -hmm. We shall call it a Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. But I've learned to understand we are all of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jewish traditions are Christian traditions. We have, the Christianity has walked away from the Jewish traditions. Well, I, it is what it is. So, um, one of the things that I would like to do for you is I would like to blow my shofar. And uh, this is a shofar that I ordinarily don't carry along with me. Believe me, it's my favorite. And uh, it's not fancy embellished. And uh, it's not a whole lot to look at, except it's just an animal horn. But this one is very significant to me in that this, this horn was acquired in the Jerusalem, in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. It was purchased and brought to the United States and sold as a fundraiser. And not really knowing its history, I purchased it. And I purchased it rather affordably. So it wasn't any great sacrifice on my part. But when I found more about the history of this particular shofar, I learned to understand as I look at all of the others that uh, this one is unique. The outside, instead of being well buffed and smoothed up like it would be on a buffing wheel, it's been done by hand with all of the, the faceting, the flat spots left behind on the outside. And yet it's remarkably thin. Ordinarily, in order to get a real good tone out of a shofar, they take the horn and they buff the outside down until it's polished and shiny and you get a thin surface that has greater resonance, but this one just being scratched off a little bit with a flat tool has, is thin. And I have picked the shofars that you see, they play four, perfect 440 notes. And they play for starting with the, with the D on the bottom end. This one here on a 440 scale, plays an E flat, B flat, E flat, B flat, G flat. Real. Excuse me, G. Right up my alley. Bart? No, up my alley. Right up my alley. <laughs> right, right up my alley. Right up your alley. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how this is going to play out tonight, but one evening, when I was before a large group of Christian people who were learning about the feasts, and I was new into the shofar world, and I had just acquired this one. I was asked to give a little dissertation on the shofar and blow the shofar. The lights were dim, and when I finished, well, this is the shofar I used. And when I when I finished, I looked around the group, and uh, I kind of what I thought I saw, I kind of shrugged off, and I continued on with my presentation and went on. But the hosts of this were they communicated with me like so many all by emails. And they all told me what I, they affirmed what I thought I had seen. And what I had seen when I looked around the audience was everybody's eyes were misty. And I could, I'm touched by it. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was touched by it. Their eyes were misty. And uh, there's something about the shofar that is just special. And for some people it, it really moves them and it did me. And uh, anyway, uh, they, had, they had commented to their hosts that it moved them to their quick and it brought them to tears.
There's something about an E flat note that yeah. is just special. Yeah. And to begin a time of self affliction, a request for for forgiveness and atonement, and to begin it with a, with a humble heart yeah. and uh, is special. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> With that, I neglected like a very important thing. The Shafar, the history of the Shafar, later found out it's a survivor of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, another thing that uh, is traditionally done on Yom Kippur by the Jewish community uh, is that they go through the prayer book. Now, we're not going to do this tonight. Last year, uh, we did a uh, uh, a symbolic uh, gesture by going through all 613 Torah commandments. Remember that, Brother Nick? Vince was here. Amen. Paul was here. Pastor Fonda was here. Pastor Johnny was here. Amen. And uh, we went through all 613 Torah commandments and we read them uh, so we'd understand what they were. And uh, But, you know, I just wanted to share how beautiful a uh, Yom Kippur service was for me that I attended at Chabad. Now, it was all in Hebrew, and so I was just reading along the prayers uh, in English as everybody else was, was speaking Hebrew. And uh, what, because it was a 25-hour thing that the Chabad was doing. They were doing the, the entire all night long. The men were staying, and they were reading through all the prayers. And they were asking God, they would go through the scriptures in such a way, and the Psalm, the Proverbs, and all of the uh, first five books of the Torah, of the, of the Old Testament, the Torah. And they would call out each one of the sins, the, the, one of the, each one of the transgressions that we could commit, and they were asking God to forgive them if they had willingly or unwillingly or unknowingly uh, committed these sins. And then they would go and they would remind God to how he forgave the patriarch when he did this. And they, he forgave David when he did this. And how merciful God was. And it was like a discourse, a love song between us and God. Telling God how wonderful he was for forgiving his people. And uh, asking him to forgive us. And, and a time of true repentance. And... Uh, for me, it was very telling because as we went through these things, I realized how many shortcomings. What did Jesus say? He taught us that if you broke one law, you broke them all, you know? And, uh, you know, I've never murdered anybody, and there are some others that I've never done. But there were a lot of, a lot of things in the Scripture that as I went through... Uh, and I was, I felt alone even though I was in a room full of people because I was the only one reading in English. They were all speaking Hebrew, reading these prayers in Hebrew. And as I read along, I started weeping at gratefulness for everything that Jesus had forgiven me of and for all of the things uh, that I had done in, in my life, uh, both while I was in the church and when I was out of the church. You know, it wasn't just the five years I was, everybody, uh, we tend to look at the, the time when we're running from God or we're backslidden or we're out doing things that uh, we were taught not to do. But do you know that uh, a lot of people, they never quote unquote backslide, but they're living sinfully right in the church. You know, they have a religious spirit. They want to look really beautiful on the outside. But they become like the Pharisees, like that Jesus uh, condemned. And so they were whitewashed sepulchers. And uh, I went through these scriptures and I was reading them and I was thinking about throughout my whole life all of the mistakes I had made, but how much God loved me and how much he sent Jesus to save me. 
and how much uh, it was a very beautiful, intimate time with with the Lord for me. And uh, so I want to encourage you during the next 25 hours uh, just to take set some time apart and to ask the Lord what that means to afflict yourself. You know, uh, whether you're going to fast or whether you're going to deny yourself some pleasure or something, you know. But set the time aside wholly into the Lord, kind of like we do at communion when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a form of Yom Kippur. It's examining yourself. And uh, that's really, that's a whole other teaching. I won't get into all of that. But at Yom Kippur, it's a time to really look at yourself and see what God has done for you. And also see what things that you would like to bring before the Lord. And that's why we fast a lot of times. Because we know that when we deny our flesh a food and things that it wants, uh, that it gives us a, a better ability to hear from God. You know? And so I just want to encourage you to take some time and spend it alone with the Lord. And just... Uh, uh, worship him and ask him to show you things that he would like you to make corrections. Ask him if there's anybody uh, that you've wronged that you he would like you to make amends to. You know, sometimes you don't think there's anything, and then something strange will pop up. You know that all of a sudden you realize when you said this or did did that that it hurt somebody's feelings or it, or it caused them not to want to be in church or, you know, we can be a stumbling block to people and not even mean to be. Do you know that? We can be a stumbling block to people and not even mean to be. We can think we're doing something to honor God and run somebody right out of the house of God. Did you hear me? We can think we're honoring God, but in doing so, run somebody right out of the house of God. And I can't tell you how many ladies I've seen come into church wearing what other women and other church ladies would consider inappropriate clothing. And because of the looks and the, the actions of, I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about in the whole church, everywhere, you know. Uh, because of the things that were said to them and the way they were treated, they left and never came back to church. But we have to be really careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and uh, that's not our job. That's that's God's job. Our job is to love on them. You know, when they come in, teach them the truth, to teach them about the Lord, and to love on one another. And I just feel that uh, that we've missed the boat so much. We missed the boat, and uh, we've we've taken on this Western culture of churchianity. And uh, we've, we've even neglected the things that God said were important. So I just want to encourage you to ask God what that means to you. I want to encourage you to start coming out. We were going to go over some of the Yom Kippur questions in, the, in our workbooks. We didn't do that tonight. But uh, Brother Kevin, if you go to your uh, computer, I sent you a link to some Yom Kippur music. And I would just like to finish off this evening. It's about 20 minutes. Uh, if you need to leave, you can go quietly. But I just would like to finish this off with a time of, uh, of, of worshiping God and introspection, asking His Holy Spirit to uh, show us how we can be more like Him, how we can grow closer to Him. Amen? Did you find it in Kevin? All right. I would have just sent it. Well, that's when you sent it. That's not when you sent it. There should be a link. I sent two of them because one of them looked funky. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's the link right there. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu. ואלוהי אבותינו, אלוהי אברהם, אלוהי יצחק ואלוהי יעקב. האל הגיבור הגדול והנורא, אל עליון גומל חסידים טובים.
וקונה הכל, ושוכח חסידי אבות, ומביא גואל לבני בניהם למען שמו באהבה, מלך עוזר ומושיע ומגן, ברוך אתה אדוני מגן אברהם. בלגסלוין תגספוד בוך נש. בוך עצוב נשך בוך אברהם, בוך יצחק ובוך יעקב, בוך וליקי אימגוצ'י, סטרשני בוך פריבזניסיוני וזדיושי פראבדניקם, תוורץ פסיבו ז'בובה, בוך פומנישי דוברי דילה עצוב ידיושי איסקופיטלה דתיים איך דתיי, שטובי יבוא אימא פרסלבלאלס ולבבי נשי, צאר איסקופיטל, ספסיטל אישית, בלגסלוון תי גספוד שיט אברהם, תי וליק ובקי גספוד וסקרישאיושי מרטווך, תי ספסובן ספסאץ, תי נפלניאש ז'יז בלגדתיו, פביליקאי מילסטי וסקרישאיוש מרטווך, פדזשוויש פדויישיך, איסצליאש בלניך, אסבבשדאיש פלנך, איבסטנבלויש ורו, ספящих в пепле, кто подобен тебе, Творец великих дел, и кто сравнится с тобой, Царь, умерщвляющий и воскрешающий и дающий спасение, ты верен воскрешать мертвых. Благословен ты, Господь, воскрешающий мертвых. Bahu Hatah Adonah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Eloheinu Melech HaOlam
ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, שציוות לנו לתקוע שופר. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, שציוות לנו לשמור הכל שכל השופר. ברגסלווין תיבור, צייר סילנה, פבלי אפשי, נאם טרוביץ, שופר. повелевший нам слушать голос рога, повелевший нам вспоминать о милости Твоей, о благости Твоей, о любви Твоей, 
о верности Твоей. жаждем слышать Слово Твое. Мы жаждем, чтобы наше сердце стучало в том же ритме, что и Твое сердце. Отец, мы просим Тебя, настрой нас, как, как а, умелый музыкант настраивает свои инструменты, чтобы каждый звук исходил из наших сердец, чтобы каждое помышление исходило из наших сердец.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you, Abba, that uh, you brought us together here and that we broke bread earlier and now that we've uh, learned something about this feast that you've declared, holy, holy convocation unto you forever. And Father, I ask that uh, you would uh, speak to us during this time, that we would understand the uh, what it means to observe the feasts from the perspective of receiving Yeshua as our Savior. And so, Father, we just get consecrate this time to you, we consecrate ourselves to you. I ask that we would grow closer and closer to you, and Lord, that we would uh, be children after your own heart, that the heart of the Father would be the heart of the child that we would have your heart, and that the mind that's in Christ Jesus would also be in each one of us. And that we would walk in the authority and the counsel of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you now, Father, and give you all the praise and glory in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Mashiach, the Messiah, I pray. Amen, amen. 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 May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his shalom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go with God tonight and be blessed and thank you for coming out today. Um, earlier tonight, we had that same thing on and um, just even in my body it was reverberating the severity of this hour. A solemnness of repentance. You know that feeling when you have a brother and sister and your brother or your sister's in trouble? And you just, you know, there's times that, you know, where it's not even like, ooh, I hope they get it. Or, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh God. You know, where it's like, I don't want my father to come in and get me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm serious. It's a time of asking for mercy and really repenting before the Lord of known or unknown sins. And I got earlier um, uh, the 91 about the um, the father, you know, where it's like the covered by his, um, to, to hide in the shadow of the Almighty. Because as I saw these black clouds were coming over almost as in the days of the Exodus, when they put the blood on the doorposts. I mean, it's that serious. We need to put the blood on our doorposts, on our animals, on our houses, on our names, on our reputations, on anyone that even speaks our name. The blood of Jesus. It's a new day. We're coming into a new season, and we've been through a lot, but I'm telling you, when the wrath of God is no joke. And we just we just thank God for his mercy and his grace and and the precious, precious blood of Jesus. Precious blood of Jesus. Precious blood of Jesus. We cry out, Father God, for your mercy and that we would know your love that we can call you Abba, Abba Father, and that we would feel your love during this time. Love you, Jesus. Love the sound of the shofar, I kept hearing the words broken and contrite. And I, I looked them up, and I, I've known this scripture, but the Lord reminded me of it. And uh, 
Let's see where it starts. My phone jumped. starts out, Psalms 51, it says, For the music director, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he went to Bathsheba, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your mercy, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are just when you speak and and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was born in iniquity and in sin when my mother conceived me, and surely you desire truth in the inner being. Make me know wisdom inwardly. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness to the bones you crushed. May rejoice, hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew your steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Take not your ruach from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, God of my salvation. Then my tongue will sing for joy of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you would not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it, nor be pleased by burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's what came to my mind when I heard the shofars. And I recall that we were told to listen to the voice of the shofar just a few weeks ago. And uh, so I hope it blesses you tonight to know that God speaks to us in many, many ways. And and when we have a broken and contrite heart, he is willing and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can walk uprightly with him in right standing. And this is the year of the door in the Jewish New Year. And we are going to be looking for the doors that God's going to be opening in our lives to reach the lost. The doors to see lives changed. And the doors to see what he's going to do on, on the horizon. And this is a new season and a brand new year to seek God, to walk with him, to see exactly what he wants for our lives and to be obedient to him. So praise him tonight. Thank you, Pastor Fonda. Kevin, I just sent you something, a messenger real quick. I I thought you guys would all like this. This is a standard old chorus. This was last Sunday night. It was uh, Mark 209. They were up at the Folsom a Baptist church up in Tulsa after they were here with us in the morning. Yeah. And they did this little piece a cappella. I missed the first line, but after that, I got the rest of it. So I think you'll enjoy this. And I know Oh! <laughs> 
Thank you. Amen. 